So we've got this crazy case that's been building up for some years and there's been a big uh, piece of this story that's come out this year uh, about the, the evidence, the accusations of drug trafficking by the Honduran president himself, Juan Orlando Hernandez. Now he has not been formally charged, uh, but there has been accused by US prosecutors in a US court of law in another case and his brother has been charged and convicted. It's a really big case because we now have very large numbers of Hondurans arriving at the US border, Honduran minors in detention centers in Texas and other states. So a big part of the story of why Honduras has been melting down is accusations of drug trafficking against the Honduran president. But a lot of the details get lost. Now, uh, a good friend and colleague, Jeff Ernst, has been doing a fantastic job covering Honduras for four years, uh, been based in Honduras and going back and forth, and was one of the few people inside the latest trial, which was against the drug trafficker Giovanni Fuentes Ramirez, in which the US prosecutors also said that the uh, Honduran president was involved. So, so great to talk to you, Jeff, about all the different strands of this case. Let's, I mean, yeah, to, 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 to open this, um, we've seen, you know, two key cases. Uh, how strong do you think the evidence is that they've shown in these other courts against the Honduran president himself? Uh, I, I think, you know, at this point, the, it, they could present a case tomorrow uh, that I think would probably lead to conviction um, based on the evidence that we've seen presented in the trial against his brother um, and also the uh, trial most recently this past month against Giovanni Fuentes Ramirez, who supposedly paid him $25,000 in bribes and in exchange for access to a cocaine laboratory and, and protection and other stuff. Um, but really, I mean, they have a number of witnesses, cooperating witnesses, um, who are in custody who can, could testify tomorrow against Juan Orlando. And, and it would be really one of the biggest takeaways from this this most recent case is that this guy was convicted on less evidence than what they have currently against Juan Orlando Hernandez. Um, so to me, that's really the best barometer of, of where we're at. And that's just what the evidence we've seen in these two cases. Uh, I think it's safe to assume there's probably more evidence out there. Um, and we see little little hints at things, possibilities. Um, but the case is, is definitely actionable uh, from a prosecutorial standpoint. Um, and based off what I've seen in, in other cases of, of these kinds, uh, the evidence is certainly sufficient for, for conviction. So giving some, some more background about this, uh, for people who aren't as familiar with the area, so Honduras is a large country within Central America. Um, it stands there uh, on the route between Colombia and Mexico, so it's traditionally for some decades been used as a, as a bouncing place for cocaine to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, the President Juan Orlando Hernandez um, has been in power since 2013. I actually interviewed him in 2014. Uh, when he was coming in and talking about the fight against drugs, uh, interviewed him for Time magazine, talking about you know partnership with the United States and how the United States should give money because it's their fault that Americans are, are snorting cocaine. He helped the Obama administration in stopping Honduran child migrants in 2014, give the United States a sort of a lot of military activity in 2014 then, um, and then also. Um, had a, a close relationship with the, or, or, or a friendly relationship, we should say, with the Trump administration. 
He um, was one of the Honduras. Now, his re-election is, is alleged to be fraud in that re-election in 2017. And we have new elections for Honduras this year. So a lot of pieces in this puzzle. Talk a little bit, uh, Jeff, about what it was like going to this latest trial, so the latest trial against Giovanni Fuentes that you were sitting in there. Um, could you talk a little bit about what the atmosphere was like? I, I covered some of the Chapo trial, which was a lot of fun, to be honest. I mean, it was a crazy big show atmosphere. What was the atmosphere like for this trial of Giovanni? Uh, I mean, this was totally different um, because of COVID, you know. Uh, uh, and then totally different from the Tony Hernandez trial, which was, you know, intense at times. Um, you know, there were crowds, there were shady people showing up. Um, there was weird stuff going on. Um, you know, it, 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 it was intense just being in the crowd. Um, it, this time though, uh, because COVID only, uh, like six, uh, spectators were allowed uh, inside the room, the courtroom, including the press. Um, and then there was a, another courtroom with a camera feed, but um, that's not the same. I don't know how many people were in there, but I don't, I don't think that that many. Um, so it, it just, you know, the courtroom is practically empty. Everything's taken way longer because of all these COVID protocols. So this case, it dragged on almost two weeks of, of just the government presenting its case um, and for a case that just wasn't wasn't that big. Um, so it was it, it was slow um, and, and just quiet and a lot of there wasn't quite the same intrigue as uh, in the courtroom and particularly in the audience that you've seen in, in the Chapel trial or even the Tony Hernandez trial. Now can you talk through some of, of actually what this cocaine trafficking operation was and and, and was the Tony Hernandez, the brother of the president, and the drug trafficker Giovanni, were they linked as part of the same cocaine trafficking operation or were they both kind of different or and exactly what was the the cocaine trafficking operation that they were convicted of um, being involved in? That, that Tony was convicted of, or 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 Giovanni Fuentes, or both of them. Yeah, both of them. Yeah. The, I mean, the way the government is portraying this is is all part of one government-backed uh, conspiracy. Um, and, and so, in terms of of this latest uh, narco who was convicted last month, Fuentes, uh, his link to Hernandez, and Hernandez is basically like the linchpin. In, in this conspiracy. Basically, it's all the drug traffickers who conspired with the you know, current um, power structure, which is you know, Hernandez and the National Party. Um, so Fuentes, his link is, he, he's you know, he got a bunch of different links to the National Party. Um, he hung out with his businessman who's a big National Party donor. And apparently at one point at that businessman's office, offices, or, or twice actually, he met with Juan Orlando, paid him some alleged bribes. Um, and Juan Orlando agreed to offer protection. Um, notably, nothing ever happened to, to Fuentes in Honduras. Um, in part, even though at one point a cocaine lab was, um, interdicted or seized on property that was in the title of this businessman who Fuentes hung out with all the time. And Fuentes at the time was uh, tending to a coffee farm on land uh, and was a suspect, but, but they basically got, got the investigation squashed. Um, so that kind of fits with this pattern of these drug traffickers in this conspiracy who, who, you know, been able to avoid consequences in, in Honduras, um, you know. Now, just getting to some of the mechanics of the trafficking itself. So you talk about a lab of, of cocaine being processed in Honduras. Where was that lab? Which part of Honduras? 
It was it was near San Pedro Sula in the northwest. Uh, they were bringing the the pasta from Colombia uh, and producing supposedly two to three hundred kilos a month, um, which you know was a significant amount. Um, it could be very profitable. Um, but as one of the narcos who testified said, it's also kind of double the risk to to have the lab. And he said it's just best to, you know, bring the, the finished product to Honduras. Um, but, you know, it, it really this Fuentes guy, it, he wasn't like a big, big kahuna sort of type, you know. It, 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 he wasn't one of the big capos we've seen, even on the Honduran kind of clan level. Uh, he, he was a much lower guy. Um, without a doubt, and really, I don't think there would have been interest in him in him from you know the Southern District of New York, uh, and um, if there weren't this link to Warner Lander Hernandez. So, so they're bringing uh, cocaine paste from Colombia. Just from, do you know which part of Colombia it was it was flying from? Um, I don't think they ever specified that. Hmm. Um, you know, and, and and it was there was and it was it was all paste. They, they didn't talk about any. Did they talk about any finished uh, kilos as well from Colombia? Uh, I, I mean, yeah, Fuentes did did both. Hmm. Um, um, he supposedly had an airstrip that um, he'd land planes from Colombia and Venezuela. Um, hmm. I think they mentioned the Apure region, where where a lot of these planes were coming from for a while. First. Colombia, then to uh, Apure, Venezuela, along the, along the border there, and then departing from there. Um, so yeah, he was doing a little bit of both. He actually supposedly got his start out um, selling cocaine in Florida with this partner of his that would send it to him supposedly inside tires of airplanes. Um, and he was selling like one to five kilos a month that uh, obviously in smaller portions in, in in Miami then for a little while uh, about about a decade ago or a little bit more a little bit more over a decade ago um, so that's kind of interesting that they had this scheme somehow they were filling up the tires of, of planes uh, leaving I assume from San Pedro Sula nearby um, <laughs> so it's an interesting scheme Right. Airplane tires, yeah, I never thought of that one. Airplane, I mean, car tires is a classic old one. You know, people stash marijuana in car tires. Back to the seventies, you hear about that in narco corridos uh, from the nineteen uh seventies. -huh. These are very tigres del norte, but um, but in plane tires, that's something else. So, um, the brain of cocaine from Venezuela. It's important you mentioned Venezuela. You know, we know a lot of. Um, evidence of, of, of cocaine coming out of Venezuela and accusations of high-level officials in the Venezuelan government as well and you know the, the word narco state is sometimes used about the Venezuelan government as well um, and perhaps the Honduran government so so we have uh, uh, protected by the Honduran government planes of cocaine flying in from Colombia Venezuela to an airstrip sometimes it's paced and they've got a lab just north of um, San Pedro Sula, a big and, and, and famously violent city at many times. Now, how is the cocaine then reaching the United States mm -hmm, in, in these mm -hmm. particular operations they're talking about? Um, you know, they didn't really talk too much about that specific in, in the case. We, we do, did find out that some of it was sold to the Sinaloa cartel. Um, some of the cocaine would be given off to the Valle Valle drug plan, which is probably the biggest drug plan in Honduras along the western Honduras border for a time. Um, and they were distributors to the Sinaloa cartel too. Um, so they would just take it from there. Um, but, you know, according to sources, um, Fuentes it, it would export through the port of Puerto Cortez, which is the largest port in Central America, um, you know, in containers. Uh, this is a guy who had business interest in, in containers and shipping businesses. Um, and so sources say, you know, he, he was, he, he had, you know, access 
control essentially at, at, at the port of Puerto Cortez, um, which was right near his, his cocaine lab too. Um, and basically to pay people off so they kind of turn off the scanners for the containers when they go in into in port um, or figuring some other way to, to, to slip it in. But, but that's one of the ways sources said he was, he was shipping otherwise, uh, you know, through Guatemala um, near the uh, Caribbean side of, of Guatemala, which is right where it was based too. So, so the ships uh, from Puerto Cortez would go directly to Florida, or some of them would just go to Mexico, or, or, uh, or I think some of them might even go to Europe. You know, wow. um, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, they could go anywhere. Um, and uh, I, I, I really, I really think it, a lot more cocaine is being trafficked that way than than we're really aware of, because um, it's really, you know, impossible. Um, really check all those containers that come into the U.S. and, um, and, and uh, the narcos, they're, they're always devising new ways to hide, hide their product. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we know that uh, this was going on at that port. Uh, we've heard other things about it in other cases, uh, including National Party officials, working, scheming with the Sinaloa cartel to do the same. Um, so we, we know it's been done. Um, who knows, they, they, there's rumors they put in coffee. Um, you know, he had coffee interests too, he had coffee interests, he had shipping interests, he had biomass interests, you know, he had all these different things that could work really great for stuffing some cocaine in, inside a container uh, and shipping it out essentially legally, you know. Well, Honduras coffee is great. <laughs> I love it. It gives me that buzz. So I know one of the reasons why. Uh, now, uh, I'm, I mean, talking about those ships going to Europe, that's interesting. There's a huge uh, European cocaine market. A lot of big busts that have been made recently, in fact, in, mm -hmm. in Germany and Belgium and Holland of cocaine coming in. So that's a big thing. Uh, and for those who aren't familiar with the U.S. prosecution laws, one of the interesting things that happened some decades ago is that it doesn't matter if the traffickers are directly involved in taking these drugs into the United States. If they've got their hands or are involved in moving cocaine from Colombia to Honduras, from Honduras to Mexico, they can be extradited to the United States, charged and convicted in the U.S. court because they're part of that conspiracy. Now, I'll talk about the prosecutors. So we saw, uh, we see this crew of prosecutors in the Eastern District of New York who went after El Chapo, convicted El Chapo, uh, Andrea Goldberg uh, being a lead prosecutor, uh, a, a woman who born in Argentina, grew up in the United States, uh, and is a big, um, one of the big hitters against Latin American drug traffickers in, in the US uh, prosecutors. Is this the same crew as he says it's different? Is the Southern District, is it a different district of New York or is it the same? And how was, you know, who are these, who are the prosecutors um, behind this case? Um, it, well, it, the ones going after this conspiracy are, it, the, it's really under the top dogs, Emil Bowles, watch um, this whole conspiracy. He led the uh, prosecution of Tony Hernandez, um, and he's the chief prosecutor of the narcotics, International Narcotics Unit. Um, so they really, you know, the SDNY, the EDNY, um, they're two of the preferred partners for the DEA, along with, you know, the Southern District in Florida. Um, and I think a, a district in Virginia too. Um, those are the ones that handle most of the, these kinds of cases. Um, but they're, they're very ex experienced in this. Um, you know, they, they work on tons of cases. Most of them just don't ever go to trial, you know. Now, have you had much luck talking to any of the prosecutors off the record outside of the government? I mean, they, you know, they're hard people to talk to. No, no, I, I, that, that'd be a dream. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, no, 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 not prosecutors, no. How about the agents? Have, have, have any of the agents on this case, the DEA agents, given you much on this? No, no, no. I mean, the DEA is not like it used to be, you know? Yeah. Uh, they used to, if this was the 1980s, I'd probably have them calling me up all the time, you know, their local guy at the embassy, or trying to plant crap in my ear, you know? Uh, uh, but they're so hermetic uh, uh, these days. Um, it, it, it was actually interesting during, during at the beginning of the case, the, uh, the defense attorney accused uh, the, press, the government of leaking information to me. Uh, and I brought up an article I'd written before, <laughs> before the case and said, this could, information only could have come from the government. Uh, and <laughs> uh, but no, I've never spoken with the prosecutors. Yeah. So, so, so where can you say where that information came from? No, no, no. I, I, <laughs> I, I can say though it, it was not the prosecutors. No. Right. So you, um, you got better sources in in Honduras and, and among among people in Honduras because you've been coming up with some great great mm -hmm. stuff. So, do you have a sense? Though talking about the DA and the prosecutors, I think I think a big, you know, important part of this case is, you know, why now to a sense. Now, what are the motivations and, and, the, and the hopes of U.S. prosecutors stroke DEA in this? I um, mean, my sense is that there's a bigger appetite for going after political targets mm -hmm. now. And partly, uh, I think, because after El Chapo, you know, it's kind of, it's hard, you can't beat El Chapo in terms of drug traffickers anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so what could, how could you beat that? Or how could you get a, a score, a result, something which makes a splash, take yeah. down a president? Yeah, um, I, I, exactly. I mean, the thing is, as long as we have these corrupt, inept governments, there will be more and more chapels. You know, a, a guy just without a corruption, I don't think, personally, I don't think a guy could get as big as a chapel got or, 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 you know, as, as big as some of these Honduran narco clans got, and they're just middlemen, you know, they don't, they don't ever get like these Mexican chapel uh, style kinds of power or money. But, um, you know, if you don't do anything against the enablers, and I, I think that's clearly uh, their, their strategy now, they're, they're pivoting to the enablers, and we've seen it in Mexico too. Um, you know, with going after Garcia Luna, going after Cien Fuegos, even though that was a debacle, but, but you know, the, the intent is clear. They're going after the enablers. And I think when they do indict Warner Landor and as we'll also see subsequent or maybe in, this, in the same, including the same indictment, multiple other high level Honduran officials, um, some of whom the DEA will, will probably be hoping might, might cooperate. Um, and make things even easier. Um, uh, but really, I mean, you're going to, they're going to, they've already sent a message. Um, and I, I, I think it's probably already had a chilling effect in terms of, I mean, we've got an election coming up this year in Honduras. It, it, you know, any legislators or politicians of any kind getting offers um of money you know from drug traffickers or or even just sources where they're not really sure where the money's coming from um might be starting to think twice uh about that i mean i, I guarantee you they are um and i think the dea feels betrayed by one orlando i think they uh I, and it, it only lasted really shortly, um, but I, I think at, at at first they 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 bought some of his crap. I don't know. Um, at the same time, I I don't know because it, it, they started investigating him supposedly in 2013, like right before he took office. So, uh, um, but I I do certainly feel it's kind of like personal though in a way. Um, that 
they just there's this guy who's you know nobody likes it when when, when somebody shakes your hand with one hand and you know it's kind of fucking you over with the other you know I, I mean I, I find it I mean he talked a good game uh, when I interviewed him in 2014 for, for Time magazine uh, and I find it very hard I mean I've met these Mexican governors uh, like Yarrington, uh, governor of uh, Tamaulipas. Um, you know, you meet these, you know, they, they later got you know, hit with drug trafficking. Um, um, you know, uh, police officials, all these people, and it, it's hard to get in their heads of the double kind of game they play. Um, I always kind of wonder, are they, um, are they just really cynical? Um, or do they even kind of fool themselves sometimes? Um, of kind of like, yeah, I'm just, you know, I know. The, but the way that they, they, these are arch criminals and, and also uh, politicians and they're, they're very, very good at like talking a good game. And you know, you, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so you can see the, the D, some of the DA guys might fall for that. You know, we've got a partner down in Honduras. I mean, and, then, and he was allowing the DEA to do a lot of operations and they were involved in this. I mean, and we've got a big American military base down there. Um, but, but also, I mean, flipping this a bit, you've also got the, the cynicism of the United States. Uh, and this is a long story going back, and we've got you know the story going back to uh, Mato Ballesteros in, in the eighties, and then we can get into some big conspiracies there about the CIA and about him flying guns down to you know armed contras to fight in Nicaragua. So we we see things in the in, in Ballesteros, and then but also we see uh, the. Uh, and that and then this government is being a partner. So he was both a partner, both to Obama and to Trump mm -hmm. um, in, in various things. You know, in Obama, I saw him use the military to stop minors. It was, again, Mexico and Central America who stopped the, the child migrant crisis in 2014. It was, and then with Trump also, one thing Honduras recognized um, Jerusalem as the capital, I believe. He went along with Trump on that. Yep. Yeah, one of the one of the first countries. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, little things, you know. You so so is this the reason, or, or what? What do you think? Why they haven't gone after him so far? If you think the evidence is so strong, I mean, there's that this unwritten rule um, at the Justice Department not to indict a sitting president that's recognized by the U.S. You know, that, that, that's how they got, got around the indictment of Nicolas Maduro of Venezuela, because the U.S. currently doesn't recognize him as the sitting legitimate president, but they do recognize Hernandez. And, and you know, it, it, interestingly, the head of the OAS, Luis Almagro, recently said in a congressional hearing that, you know, we're paying, we pay the consequences essentially for the U.S.'s recognition of Hernandez in 2017 after that disputed election. Um, you know, if the Trump administration, which just didn't care about any fraud or, or, or violence afterwards perpetrated by the state, um, it, you know, as long as they had a guy willing to do whatever they want in terms of migration. So, so they recognized um, his election, his supposed victory, even though the OIS had said, we, there needs to be a new election. Um, and, and, you know, if they hadn't recognized him, then they could have, probably would have indicted him by now. Um, and I think at this point, you know, we're seven, eight, or eight, nine months away from him turning over power, supposedly, and provided he doesn't make any moves to uh, get elected again, then I, I think from the uh, perspective of the Justice Department, you, you just wait because you can't, you can't really execute uh, uh, extradition against, against him anyways. Um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it, literally the day after he leaves office, he's, he's indicted and it's, it's un, unveiled publicly. And then they, they challenge the Honduran government, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna extradite this guy? Uh, are you gonna put a, you know, a US Honduras relationships in a serious problem if you don't? Um, 
go back to 19, go back to the 88 and, and Maka Ballesteros and you send some marshals to kidnap him and yeah. <laughs> abduct him and take him to the United States uh -huh. by the Dominican Republic and that was the thing yeah. that there and then they burn yeah. people, his supporters burn down the American embassy in reaction. So, so I mean, you know, uh -huh. or, or where's the guy that we're going to hide out in Honduras and disappear somewhere or, or run somewhere else, you know, uh, you know, run to Venezuela. Um, <laughs> you know, you know, it's like, a, I mean, le you know, left wing, right wing, who cares? It, it's, it's, it's all money and protection. Um, what do you think about the election in Honduras? Do you think there's a chance of him going for re-election or who, or how is the election looking? Is it going to be National Party again? Is it going to be the yeah. Solayista, uh, which is the, you know, the guy who kicked out in the coup in 2009, yeah. his party or allies of his who are going to make it in? I, I think the play for him really is getting his, his chosen successor elected and therefore maintaining a quote of power. Um, what he doesn't want to have happen is what happened to the president before him, who got marginalized and then watched, you know, his wife get uh, uh, jailed and imprisoned or in, on corruption charges and the kind of thing that never would happen. It would you'd have control over if you maintain your your quote of power, uh, really in, in in politics. So. Really key for him is maintaining that, that power, particularly over the Supreme Court, because in Honduras, it's the Supreme Court that ultimately decides whether or not to approve an extradition request from the U.S. Um, so Hernandez is going to want to maintain his influence there. There's going to be a new Supreme Court elected in like a year after um the the general election in, in um, this fall um so that that's key for him just getting as many of his strong allies in uh continuing in positions of power um and then maybe even he might show up as a vice president um even though that's kind of like a, a figurehead, but still it, it would be symbolic and, and maintain um, some power for him and keep him on the inside um, and keep him in the room. Um, and, and just that way, it, it have some more control over his, his fate. Um, but I mean, this guy's, he's not going on vacation to, to Disneyland or, or <laughs> anywhere, anywhere outside of Honduras, really, as soon as he's out of office, you know. What's it been like for you and the journalist community generally, including the, the you know, the Honduran journalists, um, with these accusations coming out against the president? Has he not kicked back on these much against journalists? Is he not, you know, did he not early on say like, you know, you're defaming me. How can you accuse me of these things when they started, when these stories started coming up? Or, or what's mm. the reaction been there? Has there been any, any intimidation of you personally? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've uh, been followed um, and uh, had other sort of issues with, uh, um, the government, um, particularly since, you know, the, the Tony Hernandez stuff came out and I, I started covering that. Um, um, and uh, there's a general fear of, of covering the topic of drug trafficking in Honduras. I, I think a lot of people have self-censored for years. Uh, of you know my local colleagues um, who just you know I mean as a journalist you, you pick and choose what topics you cover for the most part and, and so some is you know at that topic you know I'm just it's not me I'm, I'm not going to touch it um, and so when this stuff first started coming out uh, there was a lot of fear um, on touching the topic but now I think 
um, the that fear is 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 going away, and and Hernandez is losing his grip over over the media. Um, he still has it over certain certain outlets, but um, you in the past you'd see some big pretty big news would come out and and it, it'd be amazingly silent in, in 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 the mainstream media or whatever you want to call it um and now they're I, I think they're definitely covering it better and i think people are losing that fear um just because it's, it's such a big topic it's out there everyone everyone's talking about it you know uh as opposed to just a few people talking about it However, not many people really do in depth, uh, you know, trying to dig a little bit deeper than what's public. That most people are just kind of reporting the stuff that comes out publicly, and 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 I think that's when it, uh, you get into a little bit more trouble, um, like I've had, and and like a, a number of other colleagues who've had it much worse, and I don't have the same privilege that I have of, of being. An American citizen, or you know, if I have problems, I could just leave uh, if I want, or you know, I I can call up the U.S. Embassy, <laughs> uh, which I've had to do, um, and uh, uh, you know, my colleagues can't do that, you know, and um, their their life is much cheaper, um, so it's it's a much tougher decision for them. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it's it's definitely intimidating um, for sure. But I think like even in Mexico, I don't think any American journalists have been killed, right? Well, um, not for some years. There have been American journalists killed uh, going back to the last was 2006. And, I, and I, I, I mean, you know, foreign journalists, I should rather yeah. say, not just American. Yeah. Say, um, uh, but in fact, also a Honduran journalist was killed here um, uh, who left San Pedro Sula. A cameraman uh, was with a, a guy who was killed in San Pedro Sula, and then the, the cameraman was killed here. Uh, but a last question, then, uh, Jeff. Uh, you know, something that, that that's on my mind, and I don't know an easy answer to this. But like, you know, right now you've got um, on the southern border, you know, record numbers of child minors being detained, so overflow detention centers in, in Texas. Um, I consider this the third uh, southern border crisis, migrant crisis in eight years. We had 2014 child migrant crisis, 2018 uh, to 19, which was you know really uh, big, and then the the current one now. So it continues, um, and a way out of this has got to be trying to save Central America. Honduras has been the biggest meltdown in Central America. Mm -hmm. So you know the idea which the Biden government did put out as said, and we want to put $4 billion into Central America to solve these problems um, and, you know, help the roots, which, you know, really need you know, reduce the violence, give more opportunities. But how do we do that when you have pe people like this in government, when you have a president linked to drug trafficking? How can you, how can the United States, what should the United States do to try and support Central America, Northern Triangle, particularly El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, to try and support them to stop this bloodshed. How should that be done? And do you have any hopes um, in the next decade that this is going to reduce, that the problems in these countries is going to substantially reduce? Yeah, I mean, in Honduras, I think a lot of uh, the next decade really hinges on this next election. And I'm not super optimistic about this next election. Um, uh, but you know, even the U.S. really has a tough in terms of you know. The, the, I don't know if they're ever going to get the perfect partner, you know. Um, and unfortunately, these political systems are are so screwed up um, that I think that's one thing that really needs to be changed in order to see different kinds of people in public office uh, in these countries and also see, there's almost like, it, you can get accused of anything uh, and you, you, you won't lose your seat in Congress, 
uh, and it, it has a lot to do with the way the elections are structured. Um, you know, um, and so I, I, I think things like that need to change. The U.S. Um, you know, four billion dollars over four years. It's not. It's still just a drop in, in the bucket. It's it's much more, uh, and it's important. Um, and I think one of the most important things that um, that aid has done in in recent years is providing, frankly, it provides employment for educated people in a lot of. NGOs and U.S. government contractors that it's the kind of employment that's really not available um, otherwise in, in like in Honduras there it, one it's it's merit based you get it actually based on how smart and capable you are instead of who you know which is what all the other jobs even in the private sector in these countries go to they they go to you know oh there's a job open okay give it to uh, my nephew, you know, um, stuff like that. Um, and, and these, a lot of, a significant amount of, of jobs are created through USAID that are jobs at NGOs and other kinds of government contractors that are good jobs that if, if these jobs don't exist um, and these people aren't, you know, Getting this experience, I, I think that'd be troublesome for the, these countries. You'd see even more brain drain uh, and, and you know loss of capacity um, than you know we, we've already seen um, um, because you need this this middle class. Um, but I, just really, with you know four billion dollars, I just you, you can't do that much. Um, I would focus on um creating jobs uh and keep it simple um even like a a work sort of like the work program administration that we had in the united states during the great depression um that created tons of jobs uh if a lot of people most of these migrants if they just had a decent job that could that could just pay their bills and put three meals on the table a day, they would not leave. You know, they would even, uh, you know, deal with the the situation of of crime in the country if they can just get three square meals on the day for uh, on the table each day for for them and their family, for their their children or, or their parents or whatever. You know, um, and so there, and there's a lot of these abstract job programs. Um, I would straight up create jobs through a kind of works pro program administration sort of thing that, you know, creating jobs that will have lasting impact. You know, whenever I go to a, a park in the U.S., I almost always find a work project administration building, um, you know, they're still being used. Um, but, there, but there's no simple answer, answer. But really, I mean, you need the security, uh, you need jobs, and, and you need hope uh, and right now like with the government they have and the political system they have there's just no hope for change we're seeing I saw a recent study of uh, in El Salvador and, and the number of people who want to migrate from El Salvador right now is very low um, especially compared to Honduras and Guatemala and better for better or worse one of the reasons is probably their president uh, Bukele who Whatever you want to say about him, people like him in his country, and people are more optimistic about the direction of the country. I would say overall, uh, with his presidency compared to to past presidencies. And, and that gives you know, another big one to get into. And I was just, in fact, in El Salvador um, doing a big story on on on, on the uh, on the Bukele situation. So, but uh, but yeah, Honduras. I think you you mentioned. Uh, no jobs, no cash, no hope. It's the old uh, uh, um, hope, mm -hmm. Johnny Cash, and uh, Steve Jobs. <laughs> that, 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 that one, but uh, but um, but yeah, but um, you know, there there is hope, and this I think there is hope um, in the long term. This has to end sometime. The cycle of the last couple of decades has been crazy, and, and what you see 
in the Honduran, you know, Hondurans in the migrant trail is, is quite incredible. So anyway, thanks so much, uh, yeah. Jeff. And uh, where can people see your work? Uh, follow me on Twitter at Jeff G. Ernst. Um, I write for a whole bunch of different outlets. Thank you.